Today marks Palm Sunday in the liturgical calendar. Palm Sunday is the day which begins the week of passion and suffering of the Lord Jesus before his glorious resurrection, which we celebrate next Sunday. As we heard in the gospel story, the people had gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. When they heard it was Jesus coming into town, they got all excited and went out to meet him. They had heard of his miracles, the raising of Lazarus, um, and they were sure that Jesus was the promised coming Messiah. However, as is so often the case, their concept of a Messiah did not match God's concept of a Messiah. They were looking for an earthly king to chase out the Roman occupation, even though Jesus had said that his kingdom was not of this world. Within just a few short days, this crowd of celebration became the crowd of condemnation. Humans are fickle. Humans are wishy-washy. That is why Jesus would not commit himself to them. We read in John chapter 2 and verse 24, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. Now the word entrust in that verse means to put faith in. Jesus did not put faith in people because he understood people. How many times have you put your faith in someone only to be disappointed? It's happened to all of us. That's only one side of putting faith in another, the, the expectation that they will say or do something a certain way, and then they fail to measure up to our expectation. But there's another side to putting faith in people, and that's of the side of being concerned about what people think. I suffered for decades with the disease of a need to please. That's fairly common for the firstborn. The need to please often dictates what we are willing to say or do. It often hinders us from saying or doing something. It causes us to try to fit in with whatever crowd we happen to be with at the moment, even if it's a crowd of outcasts. The need to please is a mindset which governs our life and can only end in disappointment. Now the Bible has much to say about our mind and what it can do to us. It also has much to say about how we are to be masters of our mind rather than having our mind master us. That's something we've been studying for a long time in our Thursday afternoon Bible studies is about the mind and its effect on us and how we're to have an effect on it. One of those places where the scripture talks about is found in the scripture lesson for today from Philippians where we read in <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 that we are to have this mind among us which is also in Christ Jesus. Now the rest of this passage contains the formula for getting rid of the need to please or any concern about what people may think. Let's look at it. Verses 6 through 8 of chapter 2 of Philippians, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now the first thing we see in this is that Jesus did not promote or care about his pedigree. I've talked to you a lot recently about how the Jews were focused on their pedigree. They had to know their lineage. It's very important to the Jews. Jesus did not see his equality with God as something that had to be promoted. He didn't see it as something he had to prove. He didn't have to tell people. 
Now, whether our pedigree is noble, of good quality, or poor and miserable, promoting it, thinking about it, living there, only keeps us from being able to achieve our full stature in Christ. Now, I see this on both ends of the spectrum. There are those who are so proud of where they came from, who they were, you know, old money or whatever you want to do. They are so fixed on who they are and where they came from that there is no necessity in their mind for change of any kind. On the other end of the spectrum, there are those who are so fixed on how badly they were raised that there is no possibility in their mind that they can ever change. Now, there's also one other quality that I often see, and that is what I call the Popeye syndrome. I am what I am, and that's all I am. And those people, too, are bragging about the fact that they don't need to change. Now, each of these is a mindset. A mindset is somewhat like concrete. It has taken its form, and there is no possibility of changing that form can only be destroyed. Fortunately, however, in Christ, our mindset can be changed. The process may be slow. It may be encumbered with many problems, but it can be changed. Our mind can be renewed. In fact, we are told in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 that we are to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. What that means is you don't set about trying to change your behavior. You don't try to stop what you're doing and take on new behavior. That doesn't work. We've tried it with diets. We've tried it with exercise. We've tried it with all sorts of stuff. We set out to do something. uh, We often call them New Year's resolutions. And if we're still doing it February 1st, we give ourselves a gold star because it just doesn't happen. But renewing your mind will bring about a transformation of being of who you are. It's what he's saying. You can be transformed by renewing your mind. The word transformed here is the word metamorphosis, that of changing from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Part of that renewal of our mind is to take the example of Christ, which we're looking at. He did more than simply not count his pedigree, he changed his stature, his status. In verse 7 of Philippians chapter 2, we read, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Jesus changed his position in society. He changed his position in life. Now, the word form used here with servant is the same word used previously when it said he was in the form of God. He left the form of God and took on the form of a servant. Now, we are to have the mind of Christ and change our form to that of a servant rather than one who is served. I want you to take that thought into the marketplace, to the store. To the restaurant. Take that thought that we are to change ourselves to being that of a servant rather than one who is served. The clerk, the waitress, they're there to serve you, no doubt. But how often do we insist and force that servanthood on them to serve us when Jesus said we are to take the form of a servant? We are called to serve them. Now, that's a probably counterintuitive, might create a cognitive dissonance. But if we are called to be servants, we are called to serve those ones who are serving us. How can you do that? Do you look for ways to make their job easier and less stressful? Do you pay attention to them? Do you speak to them using their name? Do you consider their demeanor? One of the first things you can do when you go to a checkout, grocery store, uh, 
any kind of any kind of store where you're paying for something, look at their name tag. Almost all of them have a name tag. How you doing today, Susan? Username. Do they seem to be under stress? Sometimes those who are called to serve, who are, take the job of serving us are under stress because it's not uncommon for them to have to deal with an irascible customer, usually just before you get there. And they're already irritated. Somebody's put a burr in their saddle. They've been infected. And yet you are called to serve. You can turn the tables if you don't take it personally. Rather than be irritated with their disposition, seek to change their attitude with a smile, a kind word. If you'll stay open, I believe that the Lord has promised that he will give us in that moment what we need to say to be a blessing to that person. We can all do it. How can you serve the servants? Take that question with you today. If you don't get anything else, take that one with you. Because this will result in the final thing we see in our passage. The final thing we see in the passage is humility. Now humility is not the bowed head, the cowed demeanor, the sad, turned down eyes being afraid to speak. That's not humility. Humility comes from how you think of yourself. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Worrying about what people are going to say, what they're going to think, what they're going to do, be based on my actions or my speech, is thinking about me. That's not humble. Humility means that you are not thinking of yourself, what you may sound like, what others may think of you. Humility allows us to think of others more often and better than ourselves. Jesus has left us the example. We are not to focus on our background, whether good or bad, because that focus will keep us stuck for as long as we continue with that mindset. We have to let that go. Though our mindset may be as hard as concrete, we can change by renewing our mind and taking on the example of Christ. So, brothers and sisters, let us determine today that we will become more Christ-like with each passing day by putting our desires and needs behind the needs of others. Amen.